Hi, everyone. Welcome to Appalachian Traditions, an online discussion of traditional Appalachian craft, music, and dance. I'm Darcy Holdorf. I'm the program director at the John C. Campbell Folk School, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. We had over 280 people register for this event, and I'm so thrilled to see so many people interested. I see 143 people have joined already. So I'm just glad that we can have this venue to come together, even in times of social distancing. I see a lot of familiar names and a lot of new names. So thank you for joining us. Um, I hope that you're all healthy and well, and hope you're finding ways to be creative and crafty at home. We at the Folk School have canceled classes until it's safe and appropriate to resume, and we look forward to seeing you on campus when that time comes. We really miss having students at the Folk School. Um, we continue to work from home, and we're finding new ways to connect with students and instructors, such as today's program. So most of you know about the Folk School, but in case there's someone who doesn't, the John C. Campbell Folk School is a school of craft music and dance, founded in Brasstown, North Carolina in 1925. We hold over 800 classes a year in 47 subjects, including the topics of today's discussion, basketry and quilting. This year, we launched a grant funded program designed to promote and preserve traditional Appalachian crafts. We scheduled 12 master artist led classes to be held between February and March, taught by exceptional artisans who are skilled and influential in their fields. To do our part in passing traditions down to the next generation, we offered scholarships to students from Berea College, Haywood Community College, and the Appalachian Center for Craft. We started the series in February with a very exciting week. We had said Susan Levier teaching traditional overshot in the weaving studio. We had Riley Boggess teaching Southern Clawhammer banjo and Marlo Gates who taught Appalachian broom making. That week, we invited the instructors for a panel discussion on Monday night and a very interesting conversation ensued. Unfortunately, due to the public health crisis, we canceled the following sessions of these master classes, including the classes that would have started this week. So Penny Pritchard, one of the instructors from this week, suggested that we hold this conversation virtually. So we included other instructors and now we have two events planned, one for today and one for May 18th. A warm thank you to Penny for being the impetus behind these webinars and thank you to all the presenters for joining us in this adventurous new online programming. So just to give you a very short brief tutorial and I'm also going to introduce some of the behind the scenes staff while I do that, the people who made this webinar possible. We are using Zoom webinar mode, which might be slightly different from what you're used to if you're having Zoom online meetings. Um, if you move your mouse slowly to the bottom of the window, you should see three icons in the toolbar. You should have chat, raise your hand, and Q&A. If you click on the first chat icon, a window will appear to the right of your screen. Um, that is a chat box and that's a place for everyone to interact. I suggest that you start introducing yourself, telling us where you're joining from. You can go ahead and chat there. A note about the chat box at the bottom next to the two text, you will see a little blue button. If you click on that, a, a pop-up menu will appear that lets you choose who you send messages from. So we're getting hello from Tallahassee, from Stanley County, North Carolina, Tuscaloosa. So thank you, share things there and you can interact with each other. You can decide to send messages to all the panelists. You can send them to all the panelists and the attendees, or you can send a private message to someone if you click on that little button. Um, I'm going to introduce Tammy Godfrey. She is our program operations manager and she will be managing the chat box. So Tammy, if you wanna go ahead and turn your camera on, there's Tammy. Well, hello everyone. We sure do miss you all here at the Folk School, but hopefully we will all be together again very soon. So um, here at the Folk School, as you can see, it's lovely as ever. It's just beautiful here on the grounds. And as you can see, Studio Row, Never, look, never looked better. It's so beautiful here at the Folk School. Traveling down to the craft shop, 
but we will all be together again very soon. So uh, feel free to add your questions to the uh, chat box and uh, we will get them relayed to our panelists. And uh, we're just so happy that everyone's here. Back to you, Darcy. Thank you, Tammy. Okay, so next to the um, chat box, you will see a hand icon um, where that allows you to raise your hand. So after each presentation, we will have a brief Q&A where we will accept a few questions from the audience. So although you can, you can type questions into the chat and the Q&A, but if you'd like to ask a question, feel free to raise your hand during the Q&A. And if I call your name, you will receive a message asking for permission to temporarily unmute your microphone. Don't worry if you are in bed or you didn't do your hair, it's only audio, no video. So we will unmute your microphone, you can ask a question and then we will mute your microphone again. Um, next to the raise your hand icon, you will see the Q&A. If you click on the Q&A, a floating window will appear um, this will be managed by Nick, Nick Kalashek, our IT admin. Nick, do you want to tell them about Q&A? Nick, you're muted. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Nice to uh, get together. And I'm here in the lovely community room, the heart of the folk school. And uh, glad that we're all, all here together doing something. Um, so if you have questions, uh, you can post them on the Q&A and I will try to get those to the uh, panelists at the end of their, towards the ends of, of their session, they'll, they'll, we'll try to get them to answer your questions. That's about it. Hey, thank you, Nick. All right, another fun function of the webinar is that you can launch polls. So I'm going to go ahead and start a poll. When we start a poll, you should see a pop-up window that asks you a multiple choice question. Now you don't have to participate in the polls, but if you'd like to, you should see one right now asking what you love about the folk school. So um, go ahead and answer that. I will leave it open for a few minutes and then I will share the results with everyone. Um, and while you're filling that out, I just want to introduce Ted Cooley. Ted Cooley is um, going to be a, a backup moderator for me. So if um, I have any, if you see Ted again, basically I'm having connectivity issues and he will step in as the host. So Ted, what's going on in your world? Oh, there I am. I bet I can be heard now. Mm -hmm. It's so good to share this time with you folks. And I wanted to tell you that the folk school has been doing a morning song program off of the folk school's Facebook page. And we're gonna to continue to do that to bring good cheer to your homes at 7.45 in the morning. Now, if that's too early for you, we understand uh, you can catch it any time of the day if you would go to the Facebook page for the folk school and you can see some of the performers that we've already had. This coming week, we're gonna have some folks from Bryson City, some friends of the school, Frank and Allie Lee. And we hope you'll be able to join us, if not live at 7.45 to 8.15 uh, later in the day and uh, catch up with us. Thanks so much. Thank you, Ted. And thank you to everyone who helped um, make this possible, especially Nick, who helped with the IT of the webinar. Um, so for today's program, it will be a series of presentations and discussions about traditional Appalachian craft. I'll introduce each presenter who will speak for about 10 minutes and they'll tell us about their work and the class that they would have been teaching this week, followed by a brief Q&A. Then all panelists will participate in a discussion of traditional craft and we'll hear what they are doing to pass on these traditions to the next generation. At the end of the program, we will discuss the role of craft in a time of crisis and how it can benefit us while we're staying at home, dealing with uncertainty and anxiety. So um, let me go ahead and introduce the first two panelists, Pepper Corey. Pepper Corey is based in Beaufort, North Carolina. She is a teacher, author, designer, and quilt maker. Pepper has been making quilts since 1972 and done so professionally since 1975. She's written seven books and writes professionally for numerous quilt publications. She teaches and lectures both in the US and internationally. She's designed her own lines of print fabrics, stencils, and sewing and needlework notions. 
This she was scheduled to teach Southern Scrap Quilts this week, which would have been her fifth class at the folk school. Um, Pepper is also a prolific blogger and has a lot of information on her website as well as her blogs, which focus on teaching and vintage and antique quilts. And I will share those links in the chat while Pepper's talking so you can um, check out her blogs. All right. And uh, Penny Pritchard will be presenting with Pepper. Penny Pritchard is a Raleigh, North Carolina based quilting and cooking instructor and a longstanding member of the folk school family. She's been a folk school instructor in cooking since 2000 and in quilting and sewing since 2008. And most recently, she's been teaching needlework. Penny's been an avid quilter for over 35 years and has branched into many other fiber arts, including sewing, knitting, needlework, weaving, and basket making. Her latest focus is working with wool applique. She's also an award-winning chef and a cookbook author, and she specializes in breads and foods of France and Tuscany. And we have a really wonderful interview with Penny um, that recently was published on our blog, and I will include a link to that as well as a link to her upcoming classes. All right, so Pepper and Penny, you want to take it away? Sure. I'd like to say hello first and then introduce Penny. Um, my name's Pepper Corey, and I'm from uh, Beaufort, North Carolina. Um, are we going to do a sharing screen at this point, or are we already on that, Penny? No, I, I can share. Thank you. I can't do anything uh, extra when my mouth's moving. So, um, Penny and I have been friends for ages, and uh, gosh, 10 years, 12 years? If at least. <laughs> at least. Okay, and we met one another through quilting, but then Penny always takes me to the best restaurants and, and, and wherever she is, so I always trust her that way. So um, I was going to teach this class for J.C. Campbell on Southern Scrap Quilts. The idea here was that there were traditions, we thought, in Southern Scrap Quilts that people might like to explore themselves. So we were trying to find things that they could relate to. I mean, we're modern quilters, but at the same time, what do these old quilts have to say? So at this time, this is a quilt. Um, I, I'm hoping that you all are seeing the long uh, strippy quilt that has a lot of plaids in it. Hope that's up for you to see right now. If somebody could come on to uh, chat and reassure us that they're seeing that quilt, that would be great. Great. Thank you. Okay, we've got it. That's super. What is North Carolina about this quilt? Well, it uses the commonest fabrics ever. These plaids, they look like they could be off men's work shirts and ladies aprons. And then it's put together in a, it's ordered, but it's kind of casual. You can see those long um, rows. Of course, it's horizontal in this picture, but it would have looked vertical on the bed. I think. And the fabric that surrounds it all is that wonderful, wonderful deep indigo blue, which was uh, a dye that people, you know, dyed things at home, indigo blue. And it was a, a natural plant that was raised here in the U.S., but also imported. So uh, I bought this from a quilt dealer who honestly didn't remember where she got it. But she and I have been looking at it for a long time and we're thinking Northern Georgia, Eastern Tennessee, Western North Carolina, and okay, draw a dot, it's in the middle of Appalachia. So I'm really pleased to see this quilt on the screen and to think about uh, how people might be inspired to um, do something like that. Let's go on to the next photo. Oh, <laughs> okay. Which one? This one? Yes. I think okay. So. This one has got everything but the kitchen sink in it. And uh, near and dear to my heart is plaids. And why are plaids important in Appalachia? Uh, because North Carolina was ground central for the whole plaid weaving industry in the U.S. 
This particular quilt uh, is one that uh, I designed and made. It was machine quilted for me. Uh, time sometimes catches up with you. And uh, the two patterns, uh, Star of the West is the Star of the West slashed. Slashed means it has extra points. Uh, that's, uh, is Molly there? <laughs> yes, yes, sorry, I'm going to mute. <laughs> okay. And Star of the West is the compass tie block. And then the other block is called vestibule. And um, vestibule is an old English block. And I, vestibule is a hallway. The only thing I can figure out is maybe that design with the square in the center and the diamonds around it was something you might have found in a, in a parquet, well, you know, wooden floor. Uh, it has a history. Let's put up the photo of the really old quilt top. That's a detail. That's what it looks like. That was the um, inspiration for the vestibule block. This is a quilt top in my collection. And it's definitely done from samples, what we'd call the early period of the plaids, the, the plaids that were woven in Alamance County, North Carolina. Um, I love the fact that she's using the plaids sometimes on grain and sometimes not, you know. Looks like she's using samples because in various places you can find things that are uh, pieced. Let's go to the next one. Oh, okay, that's one of mine. It's a little quilt top and it includes one of the uh, star patterns, but not quite as complex. The patchwork block in the upper left is what's called the Ocracoke Cracker, and that comes from the island of Ocracoke, uh, right off the coast of North Carolina. The basket type quilt in the upper right <clears throat> is a basket that you would find in any country quilt, and below it is a house silhouette that just kind of got fancy because it's got some little triangles in it and a cat in the window. And this, that's a string quilted border. And um, I just thought that would look nice around those four blocks. This is a small piece, not a bed size quilt. Let's go on. Oh yeah, more string quilting. That, uh, there's a red and pink. Do you want the red one up? Yes, please. Sorry. No, that's okay. This came out of a class that I initially did for an online entity called Craftsy, which is now called Blueprint. I ripped out the pages of a phone book and did strain quilting uh, over the squares, the resulting squares. Of course, I, they weren't rectangles. I just folded them into squares. And I think it's that red and white check I love so much. That looks like my favorite sort of Italian tablecloth stuff. The quilting that's evident on the edges, on the borders of this quilt, is called Big Stitch. It's done with pearl cotton and it was made to be seen. So that's kind of fun. Okay. That These sorts of quilts would have been the type that you would have seen in the uh, Southern Scrap Quilt uh, class. Do we have any other uh, things to show? Are we no, okay? I don't. Okay, that's great. Okay. Um, sometimes people ask, what is, what is traditional quilting? And um, I'd also like to solicit P Penny's opinion on this. Traditional means to me, it's not really about the, 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 the colors or even the patterns. It's mostly about the end function of the quilt. A traditional quilt is one that can be used either on a bed or to wrap up a baby in or something like that. They, they are aimed towards a function, you know? Um, and uh, I think that most of my quilts end up being functional quilts. The only time I do little, little bitty things is when I need a sample for a class and I'm saying, here, pass this around, you know, cause you can't pass around a huge quilt all the time. Penny, do you have a, um, a, an opinion on what a traditional quilt is? 
Well, the part of traditional quilting, I certainly agree with you about the functionality of it and the using what you have. Mm -hmm. And um, one thing I learned from Pepper was that the Appalachian woman stayed in the block. She stayed in the quilt and was very, um, she wanted to get something done quickly and she wanted it to be functional. And she just kept making blocks that she could hold in her lap until she had enough blocks to make a quilt that was big enough to do the job that she needed it to do. And, and she used the fabrics that she had. She couldn't plan a quilt the way we have the luxury of planning because a planned quilt would need um, certain fabrics. You know, she would have to have so much of this fabric and so much of that fabric, and um, she would have to have a pattern and, you know, on a whole plan. And another thing I learned from Pepper was that um, typically an Appalachian quilt will not have sashing. Um, sashing is a border between the quilt blocks and uh, uh, an Appalachian woman would just be combining um, blocks one one to the other mm -hmm. so, because sashing would take a great quantity of fabric. So they they were the original scrappy quilters. You know that's that's a thing today, but it's uh, a genre. But that's all they had. <laughs> yeah, so. that's that's very true, and I'm glad that you mentioned that. Um, what's happening back here is a quilt that was very planned okay it looks kind of scrappy because it uses a lot of fabrics but it was nevertheless very planned and uh i got out graph paper and you know did it from beginning to end so that everything fit and uh, i'm really glad that penny brought up that thing of stay in the block um i have the feeling I, i've seen a lot of traditional quilt makers work and uh when they don't have a, they kind of know it's a general plan. I'm doing such and such a pattern and they uh, throw it out there. They've got the pieces, they're cutting it up in their lap and doing a block at a time. And you know, when you get like uh, 20 blocks, 30 blocks done, you've got a quilt, you know? We always think about putting a border on quilts too. That, that's the thing we like to do. We like to put a border, a frame, and uh, they would just bind the quilt. When it got to the size they needed, they bound the quilt. And uh, that's kind of hard for modern quilters to do. We always like to tie it up in a bow. <laughs> put, put a border on it. Put a really nice binding, <laughs> you know? And uh, I don't think that if, if you're working quick and you need to get a, a, a quilt made before first frost, you just don't have the luxury of stepping back and waiting for the nice fabric to fall into your lap. So um, I think that working with what you have is essential. So, Pepper, share with the folks the um, one you just made based on that first quilt that I showed. Oh yeah, okay, all right, I can do that. Anyway. It's over here now. Yeah. We, changed the, <laughs> we changed its location. Okay, I'm not exactly sure how big it has to be before you can see it. The strippy quilt has a baby. I'll turn it sideways like the strippy quilt was. Mm -hmm. Oh, I contained it. I had to put little borders around it, you know? I'm gonna hand quilt this baby. I'll probably quilt it in all over fans, which is a real Southern way to do it. So I believe that if you're, you're uh, working in the Southern scrap tradition, it doesn't mean that you have to reproduce old quilts, but if you're inspired by them, that's great too. Would you like to take a few questions? Sure. Some questions in here. First question just recently was, what does it mean to bind a quilt? Okay. Binding is when uh, you've made the patchwork top and you've layered it with batting and backing, and then you've done sewing through the three layers. That's actually what quilting is, is sewing through the three layers. And binding is what do you do to close the edges of the quilt. You could have cut a backing larger and brought it around and sewed it down neatly, 
or you can cut um, a strip of fabric and just sew it down maybe half by machine and half by hand. It depends on you know what you're used to doing. So binding can be a separate thing, like a strip of fabric, or it could be the backing brought around. Good question. Okay, do you want me to show the, the red quilt as a good binding shot? Oh, okay, okay. There we go. Oops. Stop it. There we go. See that binding there? That is a white and a deep rose pink, and it's kind of a check. And it was cut on the diagonal, so you got the, uh, the check going sideways, giving the effect of little diamonds. Okay, and then this, these, this solid red yeah. could be considered a, a sashing. We were talking about sashing before. I guess so. I guess so, but, but my blocks burst out of it. Yes, and then certainly not a traditional one. Yeah. Um, so this is sashing here. It is, except I, all I wanted was to make sure these blocks stood out one from the other. Yeah. So sashing does different things. It can make your quilt bigger mm -hmm. or it can set your blocks off. It can define your blocks. Yeah. It um, does a lot of... So Joan asks, what were traditional quilts backed with? Uh, well, what you had the most of is the, the uh, most honest answer. And sometimes people would piece together all different fabrics to make a back. Uh, we do see in the rural South, uh, not as much in mountain quilts, Appalachian quilts, but definitely in the rural South, you'll see something called tobacco cloth. And it was a very cheesy, thin, gauzy type fabric. And if you washed it enough, the holes would close up. And it was real easy to quilt through, to hand quilt through. So people like that. So sometimes on the old quilts, you'll see tobacco cloth. If you lived in an area where there was a textile mill, uh, you could probably get like six yards of something for an inexpensive price. And there's a gray flannel, often has a small stripe in it. And it's called Alton cloth. We're not sure, but there was a textile mill in Alton, I believe it's Alabama, and uh, it was a flannel, and it did make uh, a traditional bed quilt a tiny bit warmer, you know, to have a flannel on the back. We've got quite a few questions here for you, so just, I don't know that we'll be able to get to all of them, and we do have four people raising their hand, but um, well, let's see, what kind of thread was used for the big stitch quilting on the red quilt? Oh, okay. Uh, that, that is something called pearl cotton. And it's much thicker than regular sewing thread. It's often used for embroidery. And it comes in five weights. But the middle weight, which is a number eight pearl cotton, is the one I used for this. And uh, it, uh, it shows nicely. And uh, it comes in a variety of colors. And you can get it at lots of stores. So a number eight pearl. You do use a different needle for that. You'll probably use a chenille needle or a number four embroidery needle because you need something uh, thicker and very sharp to go through the layers for this um, extra, uh, extra strong thread. Okay, and Debbie Hansen asks, when did hand embroidery begin to show up in quilting? Was it for decorative pieces rather than practical use? Wow. Good question. Um, I'm not exactly sure when it started, but I can tell you when it got very, very popular. And that was after the Civil War and when the idea of crazy quilting, which is random patches of fabric, usually really pretty fabric like silks and velvets and things like that, was uh, embellished by embroidery. It was very much a show-off kind of craft, you know? Um, and we think we're not exactly sure about this, but we think that crazy quilting migrated from England to the US because we can find earlier crazy quilts in England. And the first books about embroidery used in crazy quilts were written by English women. So uh, uh, from then on, it was Katie bar the door. Embroidery turned up in American quilts all over the place. Um, it had turned, it, it, it was used earlier, but not to the extent that the Victorians did it. 
Tammy, you have a question from the chat. Is that right? Are you there? Yes. yes. Uh, Pepper, we have somebody that would like to know what is string quilting? Oh, <laughs> well, string quilting. And if you, you say it like people in North Carolina do it, string, S-T-R-E-N-G. String quilting is we, where you take small strips of fabric. And if you were a seamstress, you'd probably have all kinds of strips left over from hemming dresses or hemming up pants. And you usually lay that over a backing block. This little pink and red quilt was done that way. Now I cut those strips myself. Those are not all left over. But if you do see, do you see that little block? It's a real dark red and it has tiny white stars on it. That's left over from another quilting project. And uh, they're the leftovers left from sewing and you actually sewed them on top of a backing. And in this case, they were eight and a half inch squares of paper. And I sewed right through the paper. When all the blocks are put together in the quilt top, then you rip the paper off the back, but not until. So that's string quilting. I'm not sure if this quilt had any kind of backing, uh, you know, behind that. I'm not going to take apart this lovely antique quilt to see. We have so many questions and I'm afraid we won't be able to get to all of them, but um, I would like to open just to hear from someone. We have five people that have raised their hands. So I'm going to go ahead and just see, we're going to test this and, uh, and um, see if we can take a question from Judy Morris. Judy, are you there? Let's see. I think she has to accept permission to talk. Judy, are you there? Um, yes. Hi, where, where are you calling from and what's your question? I'm Birmingham, Alabama. Um, how um, is a good way to store antique quilts? Uh, hmm. Okay, show and tell. <laughs> See that shelf up there? That's eight feet up. And I stack my quilts on top of it. And I'm here in the quilt shed and I have a humidity machine running all the time. Okay. Uh, if I had a whole bunch of beautiful cedar chests, I could put it in cedar chests. Uh, if you put it in a cedar chest, put your antique quilt in a plain old white pillowcase and take it out once or twice a year and refold it differently. Do not ever put it in a plastic bag. The plastic degrades and it off gases and it can actually hurt your quilt. Uh, don't store your quilt in a damp basement or a hot attic. Essentially, quilts want to live where you live. They like the same temperatures that humans like. But a humidity machine, if you have a separate room like I do, is a good idea. Keeps another, the critters away. <laughs> another idea is to lay them out on a bed and oh, so that they're not folded. And you could you can layer them just one on top of the other or um, put a sheet between them or something. But they the folding um, will actually stretch the fibers. And so that's why Pepper said to refold them. There is a way you can look it up online to fold them on the bias, and that's a less traumatic fold for the quilt. So. Pepper and Penny, thank you so much. Um, in the interest of time, we will have to move on. We won't get to get to everyone's questions, but Pepper will be will be teaching um, October 10th through the 16th. Plaid is the new black. Um, is a, We're working on that class. It's not out in the catalog yet, but if you'd like to know more or take a class with Pepper, and Penny has um, several upcoming classes, and I did um, link to that in the chat. So um, thank you so much. I'm so glad that you were here today. Well, thank you. This was fun. Thank you. It was fun. Bye. Bye.
All right, so we're going to go ahead and move on to basketry. And if anyone had some unanswered questions, feel free to check out um, both Pepper, Pepper's uh, website. You might be able to get in touch with her that way. So Sue Williams, I'm so thrilled that we have Sue here joining us today. Um, Sue Williams is a basket maker based in Morrison, Ten Tennessee. Sue began making white oak baskets over 30 years ago. She studied with master white oak basket makers, Gertie Youngblood and Mary, Drain Mary Jane Prater from Cannon County, Tennessee. She's been an exhibitor and demonstrator for the annual white oak craft fair in Cannon County for 15 years, winning best of show numerous times. She began teaching over 20 years ago and has taught with the folk school um, since 2016, I believe. Is that right, Sue? I think that's right. Mm -hmm. She was awarded a Folk Life Heritage Award in 2019 by the governor of Tennessee. She was actually teaching at the folk school the week that she received that award. And they wrote about Sue's work. A committed and exacting artist and mentor, Sue Williams of Morrison has almost single-handedly taken on the preservation of the Cannon County white oak basket making tradition. So they went on and on and said lots of nice things about you, but I'd like to let you speak, Sue. Thank you for being here. Yes, I'm Sue Williams and I am very pleased. I live in Warren County. The next county over is Cannon County. And Cannon County is where there were so many white oak basket people. I learned from Miss Gertie and Mary Jane, and I make mostly traditional egg baskets, but I do make other styles. I have a white oak basket that is an egg basket. And you can tell by the bulges on the side, there was room for eggs when they went to their chicken house and gathered the eggs every day. And they could start out on each side and then that way they did not roll together and break. This is one of my TAAP baskets. Uh, some years we made a bigger bulge than we did other years. We did different trim on this year my trim is darker and when we put the trim on the side we did an arrow pattern and also this is called the appalachian smile and it is out of heartwood the rest of the basket is out of sapwood and they did not trim all baskets years ago, but most of them that I have made and that I teach, we do trim the baskets. I also have made some small baskets that are Miss Gertie style baskets. These two, when I finish, I will have a set of three and they will be nesting baskets. Also, I have a set of larger baskets, the same style, that are not completed, but will be before too long, that are stack baskets. So these are stack, these are nesting. I also have a huge basket. And this basket, even got a name. This is Big Bartha. It took me about six years to make Big Bartha. And Big Bertha has the Appalachian smile as well. I have a lot of older baskets. This one I'm sure was used a lot. And you can tell by the tie that it was Cannon County. Cannon County, Tennessee has the X with the straight piece coming down in the middle. In Kentucky, they have half of a God's eye. So different areas have different styles and 
When you see baskets, you know the area that they were made in. I also have this basket, which is a very old basket that's fallen apart, but I'm real hesitant about redoing it because I want to keep the old basket. Also in this area, in Cookville, Putman County, this was a style of basket that a lot of people made. And this was made by Duns and they, through marriage, are related to my husband. So this is a Duns basket from Putman County. The other style basket that we have had, and this one is out of Coffee County. This is a round rod white oak basket. And it was in Henry's Cove and Jim, when he was growing up, lived in Henry's Cove for a short time. So this was left in an outbuilding and his dad, when he sold the place, moved it. And when I saw it in the barn, I knew it had to come to the house. So this is my rod basket made by the Meadows family. The other style basket that I have, this is a garden basket. It was falling apart and a man brought it into Cannon County at the Art Center and held it up and slivers of white oak started hitting the floor. So I gave all of $10 for a basket falling apart. I took it apart, re-glued, put it back together with some older weavers. And I guess today people would call it a flower basket instead of a garden basket. But this was a garden basket and was used a lot. The other style basket I've got were like Miss Gertie baskets. And I just call them that because that was her style. It does have the Appalachian smile. It also has the X with the straight down the middle. And this was used a lot to carry stuff in as well. I have taught for a number of years. I have taught at the folk school and have really enjoyed that and all the people there. I, to me, baskets is therapy. And it is to a lot of other people because during this time, I've seen a lot of posts on Facebook where people are completing their baskets that they had started and put back. And now, since they're staying at home, they're completing all these baskets and I'm seeing pictures of them and I think that is wonderful. I have had been very fortunate to have four Tennessee Arts Appreciation students. And my last one is my nephew. And I have really enjoyed making baskets with him and he has completely has a huge old basket that he bought at an auction and we're going to put it back together and I am very pleased that he likes baskets and hopefully he's going to pass it on to his nephew and his son when he gets the son gets a little bit older. Baskets is a traditional craft. 
as well as an Appalachian craft. It has been, baskets were made because during the depression, a lot of the Cannon County people, they could make baskets and they made chairs and that was their way of living. And most of these baskets were traded for groceries that they could not buy or they were put on wagons pulled by teams that was heading north and they put chairs around the side to hold, make sideboards and then they loaded baskets in the middle and that was the transportation to get them north to where they could find a place to sell the baskets. Cannon County, as well as most of Warren, during the depression, really had a hard time. So baskets and chairs, and for Cannon County, whiskey was their way of life for a number of years. A lot of the younger people never made baskets because the stigma there that their parents, grandparents had to do it to exist. And there are not even a handful of Cannon County, County people that are even interested in making baskets. It's to me very sad, but that's the way it is. I did not know that my family was basket makers and I found out that about five generations ago, some of them made baskets. So I, baskets is in my blood and I have truly enjoyed making the baskets. Great. Sue, thank you for that. We're, we might take a, a few questions if you're ready for them. Okay. Did I cut you off or did you, ha did you have more to share? Uh, I, I, was <laughs> <laughs> I was ready. <laughs> okay. Tammy, do you have some questions from the chat? I see a few in there asking about types of baskets. Yes, we have one here that, that says, um, the round style white oak weavers, how are they made? How is the weavers made or the style of basket? Well, it says, I'm curious how the round style white oak weavers are made. Oh, they are pulled. Okay. Are you talking about the rod basket that I talked about? Those are pulled through a piece of metal to keep them round. We have another question for you, Sue, that says, are they truly made from white oak? Yes, they are. I have a couple of questions about the materials and how the material is harvested and um, how is the, is the wood aged or is it fresh? I like for the wood to be fresh. I was taught that it needed to be cut when the sap is going down. So usually I try to get my supplies in late October in November. You need to break them down immediately and you split the, it's the trunk of the tree and the, it's probably about eight or nine inches in diameter. You do it in half, then in fours, and if it's big enough in eights, if not, you start taking the heartwood out and then you start separating in the middle and pulling apart the growth ring. If it's in eights, a lot of times that might be a half inch. So you can pull it then after it's been pulled, that can be stored and you can make baskets with it later. The ribs are taken out of the areas that's got knots 
and you want to get them between the knots and you have to break them down at least in small pieces of wood that would be ready to whittle and then they can be stored. With the handles, you pick out the best part of the wood, whatever eight, depending on the width of your handle you want, or quarter. Uh, I like wider handles, so I try to keep mine wider. You pull it apart and you leave at least two growth rings and maybe a little bit more. They need to be worked down, scraped. I use a shaving horse and then sized and I use clamps and put them in clamps the way, the size I want my rim and the handle. Sue, you've got a question um, from Debbie Hansen. She says she took Appalachian basket making at the folk school years ago. She made a square market basket. Is that from a different part of Appalachia? Not necessarily. The one that some people made the wider, and I know Jim's relatives in Putman County did make a more square basket, it's still you're using a lot of the same materials. You just have when you break them down, you leave the weaver thicker than you do if it's a egg basket. Okay. Well, I think we've, we've gone a little bit over the time. I, thank you, Sue, for, for answering those questions. Tammy and Nick, if you had a, a last question, we could take one more and then we'll open up for a few minutes of conversation. Um, let's see. Um, do you process the, most of your own materials or do you, or do you ever buy materials on the market? It's hard to buy materials on the market. I have a gentleman that I have known for years and his family was in basket making. And if it's for a class, he does the rough breakdown for me. If it's something that I want to make and I want it different, I break down the tree. You've got a lot of comments here, Sue, that um, you're inspiring people to make baskets, beautiful work, thank you so much, truly worth preserving. So um, thank you for sharing. Um, I'd like to ask all the panelists, um, so if Penny and um, Pepper would like to open their cameras too, we'll just have, we have a few more minutes. Um, I, we I had planned a lot, a lot more discussion, but um, I would like to talk just a little bit about um, what you all are doing to pass down these traditions traditions to the next generation and if, if you see a lot of interest among young people or what you're doing to kind of to get, gain interest um, and, I, and I think hopefully we can kind of just have a conversation and if anyone wants to ask any questions about that so Pepper do you have any thoughts about that do you see a lot of interest among young people uh, yes, I do. Um, quilting is a very fluid uh, craft, and uh, we people who are still doing hand quilting or more traditional patterns are one branch of it. There are people who make art quilts, and they're beautiful works of art. You hang them on the wall. They were never intended for the bed. And there's people who do very modern minimalist quilts, and, and they're quilted by machine, very that the whole aesthetic is kind of different. It doesn't matter to me why a person is attracted to quilting. I'm just pleased that they're there, you know. And uh, when they're in a class, I, I do try to figure out if there is a particular um, thing that they really want to learn uh, because you try to be flexible when you're a, a teacher. You may be, um, you know, teaching a particular pattern but you might want to uh, uh, slant helping people with color. 
if if they're uh, having a problem uh, with that. I really don't care why people get into quilting. I'm just glad that they do. And it's a billion dollar industry. It really is. Um, I found, you know, I thought I was going to have to advance and do everything by machine and I'd have to, you know, really get with it and become a modern quilter. And what I found is, as uh, there's less traditional quilters, then we're kind of rare. <laughs> and, they, and people call on us and they want us to teach, you know, so I can stay with what I love and I'm perfectly happy with that. I think the main thing is to, as a teacher, not be judgmental of what anybody else thinks uh, or they get into your class for any other reason. I have things that look real modern and I'm just glad that the person is there in the class. So I was taught quilting by older ladies and I really love that. And now that I am an older lady, I just want to pass it on. Now Penny is also a teacher, so I'd like to get her opinion on that. I think I think all of these crafts are I don't think they'll ever go away because I think we need them. Our hearts need them. Um, quilting is such a comfort thing. It's practical, it's comfortable, uh, it makes us feel good. We all have memories of our grandmother's quilts or great aunt's quilts, whatever. And um, whenever I take my quilt someplace, I always get stories from people about some relative of theirs that made them. And, people want to continue the tradition or they have, they have a quilt in the back of their mind that they yeah. want to make and they want yeah. to learn how to do that and um, incorporate, you know, an idea or colors. I took a class with Pepper years ago um, and it was traditional, but uh, it was uh, stars and um, drunkard's path. And I did it in really contemporary fabrics yeah. and and it turned into a modern quilt, and um, it's one of my favorite quilts. So you can, you can do whatever you want with it, and I think people really like that. Um, it's good, and so I I see it surging on and on. Mm -hmm. so, Sue baskets. I am very happy that there are, are younger people. I'm very very happy that my nephew is. Now I've got time to work on baskets and his nephew is interested in then when I teach classes I have young people that are interested so I am thrilled that the art will be passed on. Mm -hmm. yeah, um, I have a story to tell my um, grandson was six and my son and his family were living in D.C. and there was a, a fiber festival at Georgetown University and so I literally dragged the family, three little boys at the time they were what two, four, and six <laughs> to see this and, and my son was like oh you know they won't like this and my six-year-old grandson was mesmerized by the weaving and to this and so I have, you know, fed on that and try and get them and I work with him on weaving and it's the um, the pattern making and so it appeals to, I mean, way younger minds. They, they love it. They, they just love it. Well, we, we're coming to that time. We've only got a couple more minutes. Um, so thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you to Sue and Penny and Pepper for taking the time. Um, you got a lot of questions. We could go on for probably another hour. Um, so j thank you for doing that. And I'm so glad my internet um, kept working. So <laughs> can I say one thing? Sure, Pepper, yeah. Oh, just that. Um, the class that uh, I'm going to be teaching um, is in 2021. It's not this October. It's October of 2021. So you've got a lot of a lot of uh, lead time there. 18 months <laughs> to to plan for it. That's all. Good point. Yeah. So when as soon as the catalog comes out, that's yeah. when you can you can call and sign up. And that 
sounds like an exciting class. So please stay tuned on, on May 18th, we will have the second webinar in Appalachian Traditions. Um, we will have Aubrey Atwater talking about music and dance. She's fabulous. We might even have some music in the, in the program. And we are working on convincing Lyle Wheeler to join us to talk about the ladder back chair. I, I, think, I think he's on board, so. Um, thank you so much. Thank you to everyone who attended, and we hope to see you on May 18th. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank Bye. you for coming.